This isn't just an Italian thing. This is an American thing. They called me names. And uh, WAP. They called me uh, Greenhorn. We were becoming American by learning to be ashamed of our parents. When they thought they originally had elected uh, Santa Claus, they only ended up with a devil. One nation, under God, The second generation of Italian Americans were sent back to fight on effectively the soil of their ancestors. All of a sudden, all the Italians became suspect. One of them said, we're here for the radio. And my dad said, what do you mean, radio? What radio? What did we do wrong? To these children, I was an enemy. And they would all scatter and spread out on their seats in the bus so that I wouldn't have any place to sit. I just don't see why they did not speak out challenge louder right after the war. We love the American people and uh, we would have liked to avoid uh, this terrible conflict. Were we not really Americans? Were we not loyal? Ultimately, I think this is a question of identity. There is a story. It is not a new one. Its roots are embedded in the towns and villages of 19th century Italy. But unless it touched you personally and intimately, it is largely unknown to you. Yes, you know about the hundreds of thousands of Italians who left their families to seek for them a better life in a land that promised opportunity. You know about the little Italys that took hold in mostly urban areas. You may even know something about their struggles to assimilate while desperately attempting to maintain their own identities and heritage. What you probably don't know is how this country stumbled along its road to becoming the standard by which liberty and freedom are defined. It stubbed its toe on the hearts and souls of thousands of Italian families, ultimately labeling them enemy aliens at the outbreak of World War II. Some of us are direct descendants of these confused and frightened immigrants. Some may have heard a story or two and shrugged it off as first-generation anecdotes or old-world paranoia. The truth will become alarmingly clear. This story is told in honor of our parents and grandparents whose sacrifices made our way of life possible. And like the thousands of pages which chronicle the lives of those who make this country the most ethnically diverse in the world, this chapter in our history must be recorded to fill in the gaps, to right a wrong, to learn from our mistakes. In the 19th century, as economic and social conditions deteriorated in Italy, hundreds of thousands of its people flocked to these shores in hopes of starting new lives for themselves and the families they left behind. In the years between 1880 and 1924, nearly 10% of Italy's population found its way to L'America. About 70% of these immigrants came from Mezzogiorno, the area south of Rome. Here, disease and famine were running rampant. Despite the desperate efforts of the Italian government, nationalists, and even the Catholic Church to discredit the United States and this notion of a land of milk and honey, the fact remained that intolerable living conditions forced a mass exodus. 
When I found that the only way that I could prevent my family from starving was to turn to stealing, I decided it was time to leave. I remember him holding me by the hand after we got in Palermo, approaching this boat, and he was telling me that you're going to go in that boat with your mother and you're going to go to a new world, America. Here America, well, it's what's America? Didn't understand, but anyway, it was a sad goodbye. We got on the boat. It was a rough trip. We got out into the sea, and my father was with us, of course. He went in third class because of lack of money, which is down below to the, next to the engine room, and my mother and I put us in second class. As soon as the boat got out into the open, See, she got sick and she was bedridden. For many, after 15 days of brutal passage, arrival in the U.S. produced unexpected results. Few spoke the language, nearly half were illiterate. Tired, hungry, and scared, they were subjected to interviews and physical exams they didn't understand. And if the uniformed physicians detected anything of consequence, like the dreaded eye disease trachoma, an arriving passenger could be immediately deported without stepping foot on the mainland. Then when we get to Ellis Island, I got the measles. So my dad talked to the doctor and he bribed the doctor to let him off the boat, even though I, was, I had the measles. So the do my mother wrapped me up in a blanket and carried me off. For those who were granted entry, America was a very different world than the one they had fantasized about in Calabria and Sicily. Too often, within hours of disembarking, they were the victims of con artists. Some were fortunate to have waiting relatives who preceded them. Others tried to make their own way. Still others were comfortable with the padroni, a system common in their native land. This individual would write letters for them. He would uh, charge a fee, but he would basically, to some degree, control at least superficially as part of their life until they could stand on their feet, in which case some of them never were fully capable of it. They, they remained with uh, that uh, immigrant status until they died. For too many, L'America stood in sharp contrast to the land of opportunity they had desperately sought. Where was the money going to come from? How were they going to support the families back home waiting for American dollars? Would they ever be able to send for their brothers, their wives, their sons and daughters? Combating prejudice quickly became a way of life for most. And the hatred ran the gamut, from casual taunting to serious crime. The cultures that the immigrants brought with them, and also uh, the resistance, the uh, prejudice against them, created this barrier to assimilation. Those who took up residence in this country presented a vastly different picture. The Italian comes in at the bottom and stays there. In the slums, he is welcomed as a tenant, content to live in a pigsty and submit to robbery at the hands of the rent collector without a murmur. The South should most carefully consider this problem of immigration. For the ordinary American, the Italian is a dirty, undersized individual who engages in degrading labor shunned by Americans, and who is often a member of the Mafia, and as such, likely at any moment to draw a knife and stab you in the back. Many Italians entered through the port of New Orleans. Approximately 20,000 settled in a part of the French Quarter known as Little Palermo. The air of 1891 New Orleans was thick with prejudice. Police Chief David Hennessy openly despised the Italian population in his city. And when he was gunned down by an assassin one night, he told the first to arrive on the scene that he did not see his attackers. But just before he died, he dramatically proclaimed, the Dagos did it. 
vigilantes took to the streets and immediately rounded up and jailed over a hundred Italians. Before any evidence gathering or investigation, Mayor Shakespeare appeared before city council. The circumstances of the cowardly deed, the arrest made, and the evidence collected by the police department show beyond doubt that Chief Hennessy was the victim of Sicilian vengeance. The prosecution's case was weak. Most were acquitted, and a mistrial was declared for three of the accused. Curiously, none were released. A large mob was assembled to hand out its own sentence. They stormed the jail, and when it was over, 11 men were shot and hung before the cheering crowd. Two of them were not even among the accused. Socialism and anarchism were popular among small pockets of the Italian community. The movements carried the banner for the downtrodden, those oppressed by raging capitalism. Urban bars and saloons became centers of education for many foreigners who came to hear the speeches. This tended to deepen the mistrust between the immigrants and their American neighbors. On May 5, 1920, Niccolo Sacco and Bartolomeo Venzetti, Italian immigrants and professed anarchists, were arrested while riding on a streetcar as they attempted to disperse their literature. They were known to have ties with Luigi Galliani, who preached violence. Ultimately, Sacco and Vanzetti were charged with robbery and the murder of a factory guard and paymaster in South Braintree, Massachusetts. The judge was a known bigot and the jury shared his sentiments. Sacco and Vanzetti were both convicted and despite widespread protests, were eventually electrocuted on August 22nd, 1927. The taking of our lives, the lives of a good shoemaker and poor fish peddler. Oh, that last moment belonged to us. That agony is our triumph. Fortunately, most immigrants did not have such permanent sentences imposed upon them. Much of the prejudice, although hurtful and isolating, came in less violent forms. When I was nine, we moved up into Brooklyn, Ohio, and um, it was a German Lutheran neighborhood. So therefore, we had a little bit of problem being Italian because they were all fair-haired, blue-eyed, and fair-complected. And here we came along with our black hair and our olive complexion. So we were teased a lot. And um, like the kids would get behind you and say, you know, you'll never have freckles because you're too greasy. They'll slide right off your face. And uh, greasy dago and things like that. But my parents said just ignore them and they'll eventually stop. And they did. We're all sitting in a room and a nun to get acquainted with all the children in the room, she asked everyone, one at a time, what they had for dinner the day before. Of course, this was Monday morning, so Sunday in our house was pasta. So when it came to my turn, I said, we had macaron. And she started, well, she smiled, but all the kids, naturally, they were laughing. And she, she asked me again, so I repeated myself. I said, macaron. I couldn't understand why she couldn't understand what I was saying. Well, they all started laughing twice as hard. And the one closest to me was, I guess, making fun of me more than anybody else. And I bopped them and I got thrown out of school first, first day, first grade. And they got a lot of ridicule from the local people. They said, oh, you Italians, you speak English, you know. You go in these stores, there's malls now, that's all you hear. And a lot of people say, when not you guys learn to speak English, you know. Well, they probably do. I don't say anything because I was in their position at one time. And uh, I know what it felt like. And this one particular morning, he went by this corner. There might have been 10 or 15 Irish guys standing on the corner. And one of the guys that across crossed, I called him Greaser and Dago and everything else. My dad was a scholar. He wasn't a fighter. And the guy ran over and grabbed his Stetson hat off his head and he pulled out a stiletto and cut the hat up in shreds. This cut it and cut it and cut it and throw it at him. My father had a, he told him to bend down and pick it up off the sidewalk. 
And he said, next time you come through here, this is what's going to happen to you. So my dad picked it all up, stuffed them in his jacket pocket, and came home. That was the first time I ever seen my dad cry. Catholicism played a very large role in the assimilation of Italians in America, as the vast majority of these immigrants were Catholic. Providing adequate pastoral care for them was a real challenge. In addition, many of their customs and traditions clashed with the existing culture uh, here in the United States, especially in the way they expressed their worship. Uh, here in the United States, processions were not the common thing. Uh, uh, dressed up statues, uh, expressive language, uh, 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 were not part of the normal liturgy and worship, and so it was, it was, there was a clash there in style and in tradition. The myth of paradise on earth became so Americanized as to incorporate the Statue of Liberty as the Madonna of Liberation and the American dollar bill as a sacred object to be pinned to the garments of their most cherished religious statue. So not only were they Catholics, they were coming into an environment that was hostile to a stranger. Some of the American nativism, I think, uh, negatively impacted on the Italian immigrants. The church had to deal with all of that. As a source of comfort and familiarity, Italian immigrants formed their own micro-villages that often mimicked the towns of their origin. Here they could speak their dialects, cook their regional food, and find a kind of safe harbor. They tended to, to cluster together uh, uh, along these lines, a piece of a particular town or perhaps a region, so that uh, if, if in New York and uh, lower uh, Manhattan you could actually map out the different towns from Sicily or from Calabria that people came from. Um, and you had, in, of course, in large cities you had larger congregations, you had tens of thousands of Italians living in an area, and they were pretty much cushioned from any kind of American influences for a long time. Not every settlement struggled. Some were accepted. Others were left alone. Still others either proved their worth or literally fought their way into acceptance. Entrepreneur Charles Landis had a vision for southern New Jersey. He saw the agricultural value of the land and he knew the Italians' gift for farming. In a bold move, he advertised in Italy for workers. He offered prime farmland for anyone interested in settling in his part of the world. Hamilton, Vineland, and Landisville, New Jersey, became agricultural centers, largely as a result of his strong Italian work ethic. There was an interesting bump in the road, however. In spite of, or perhaps as a result of, its ethnic diversity, Vineland, New Jersey, had a strong Ku Klux Klan presence in the 1920s. Bankers, lawyers, political bosses, and the police force all had a rather large number of Klan loyalists. What they feared most was the growing number of Italians who were moving into the south side of Vineland. On a May night, in 1923, they determined to burn a cross at a speakeasy in the section called Guinea Town. The lawyers and businessmen who paraded down Cherry Street in their hoods and robes were no match for the muscular farm workers. After a tip-off warned them of the KKK's intentions, a number of men ambushed the Klan and dispatched them in short order. The next day, an unusual number of Vineland attorneys, business leaders, and politicians were sporting bandages, slings, and bruises, claiming a curious epidemic of unfortunate accidents. Essentially, this marked the end of the Ku Klux Klan in Vineland. A whole nation walked out of the Middle Ages, slept in the ocean, and awakened in New York in the 20th century. 
My parents needed their energies for making sense of a world their own parents scarcely began to understand. These persons, when I asked them during the years I was growing up, never could explain very well what had taken place while they were dreaming across the Atlantic. Generally, it wasn't until the immigrants gave birth to the first generation of Italian Americans that significant identity struggles began to surface, or at least became apparent. For all their wisdom, none of the Italian immigrant parents I knew grasped the dilemma of their children. From early childhood pulled in one direction by their parents' insistence on old world traditions, and in the opposite direction by what their teachers told them in the classroom. In this inadvertent tug of war, the parents often prevailed, and the children were left with confused impressions of identity that were never resolved. I resolved mine by becoming an ethnic at large, with one foot in my Sicilian heritage, the other in the American mainstream. By this cultural gymnastic stance, I could derive strength from my past and a feeling of hope for my present. When we went to the grocery store, my mother asked me to ask the grocer something about, I think, potatoes at the time. They had them in boxes. That's the way they would display them. And I asked them about the potatoes, and she just hauled off and slapped me. And I said, what are you doing? She says, no, you're not asking him uh, right. I says, I am too. But she didn't leave me because she couldn't understand the language. So this went on time after time. As first-generation Italian-Americans began to shed their parents' past in an attempt towards mainstream acceptance, a clash of ideologies could be heard from the open windows of storefronts and walk-ups. One of the fears that the new immigrants had was that their children, as being coming American, became more educated than they were. And I think there was a real fear that the children would leave the family behind, would forget who they were, forget the parents, and education was, was very contentious. You know, it caused a lot of conflicts within the family. But for the children to really become adapted to American society, they needed to become educated so that they could fit in, find jobs, and be accepted. I began to ask myself such questions. Was it in the chemistry of human nature or in the interest of the national welfare for my relatives and for all other immigrants from Mediterranean and Eastern European nations to become Anglo-Saxonized? Was there any substantial difference between assimilation and extinction? In other words, wasn't the application of the melting pot concept an insidious kind of genocide? Italy finally, uh, because of the internal turmoil it was going through at this point, lack of identity, finally found a voice that would speak out and give them some sense of direction in the form of Gabriel D'Annunzio. Gabriel D'Annunzio was an Italian playwright. He, was, uh, a, uh, he had achieved international acclaim. And what D'Annunzio had seen is that if Italy was going to be anything, Italy first and foremost had to be for the Italians. D'Annunzio provided the voice, Mussolini provided the personality. And between the two of them, they both marched into Rome in 1922, and the fascist government of Italy became a reality. <laughs> So in the 20s and 30s, it's quite clear that the majority, clear majority of Italian Americans are sympathetic to the fascist regime. Um, they are not necessarily fascists. There are, there's a hardcore fascist. There are those who parade around in black shirts. Uh, there are those who publish uh, the newspapers uh, you know, supporting the regime. And uh, the leaders, certain leaders, um, uh, like Generoso Pope, who's the um, publisher of Il Progresso Italo Americano, is very clearly supportive of the fascist regime, almost down to Pearl Harbor. 
Support for Mussolini and fascism was not limited to Italian Americans. You have to remember that Mussolini invented fascism. It was a new political idea that was hard to classify. So there was a lot of interest in it in the 1920s and early 30s. In the 20s, for example, we have the, the poem to Mussolini by the Wall Street Journal uh, 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 praising Mussolini as the, the great new man coming to clean up Italy. There was the uh, Saturday Evening Post uh, serialization of Mussolini's autobiography. Uh, and in 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt comes to Washington, he sends one of his uh, chief brain trust advisors, Rexford Tugwell, to Italy to investigate fascism, to come back with a report, and perhaps there were some ideas that the United States government could use in combating the Depression. Mussolini was in desperate need of money. Italian-American loyalty to him was not confined to rallies and portrait displays. Many willingly funneled portions of their hard-earned wages to the regime back home. Ironically, American dollars helped the dictator pay for his expensive posturing. But it wasn't long before the true heart of fascism began to reveal itself. What happened to the press, to the cinema, to education, was all the thumbprint of Mussolini. When they thought they originally had elected uh, Santa Claus, they only ended up with a devil. When Italy joined with Hitler as an Axis power, lines of loyalty were less clearly drawn. After all, the assimilation window had been open for the historical equivalent of a blink of an eye. Once again, Italian-American ethnic identity was thrown into a state of flux. The hand that held the dagger has struck it into the back of its neighbor. The government of Italy has now chosen to preserve what it terms its freedom of action and to fulfill what it states are its promises to Germany. But by 1941, a very clear and unmistakable shift had occurred. The vast majority of Italians who took up residence on American soil rallied enthusiastically in support of their adopted country. Oh, God, I see the war as the transition piece that pulled us out of the wine cellar. For the typical Italian-American, loyalty was never in question. Nearly 10% of Americans in uniform were of Italian descent. And when the losses were ultimately tallied, of all ethnic groups, Italian Americans suffered the greatest number of casualties. When World War II occurred, uh, my parents were very upset that uh, Mussolini went on the side of Hitler, because Mussolini had done a great deal for the Italian, for Italy itself. And all of a sudden, all the Italians became suspect, and unfortunately, we were part of that. Not that the community suspected us, but the government did. Because so much of the broadcast was in Italian, we had to hire someone, an interpreter, to review all the copy prior to the broadcast and then actually sit in the studio during the broadcast and, uh, and censor it. And this incensed my father because he had so much to do with the patriotism of the Italians. They were very active in selling war bonds and sending material back to Italy and translating letters that they were getting back and forth. 
During the war, there were countless instances of Italian-American bravery, sacrifice, and military achievement. Captain Don Gentile and Captain John Godfrey are welcomed in Washington by their families as they return home for a rest. Captain Gentile has 30 planes to his credit. Among those was Major Don Gentile, a fighter pilot who President Roosevelt called Captain Courageous and General Dwight Eisenhower described as a one-man air force. One of the most decorated aces, he received 26 citations, including two distinguished service crosses. Clearly, Don Gentile fought because of his ethnic background, not in spite of it. There are my mother and father. They were born in Italy. They came to the United States in third class as poor immigrants. In Italy, they were poor. They could not be other than poor. Look at them now. My father is a person of substantial importance. We have a fine house and my sister Edith and I have had all we desire. My mother is smiling and happy, not a bowed woman, because she is American and resides in America. I have a debt toward America, isn't that true? I fight in part to pay that debt. Thirteen Americans of Italian descent won Congressional Medal of Honors during the Second World War for their roles in the service in fighting for the American cause. Several of them lost their lives. Private First Class Gino Murley was a machine gunner in the 18th Infantry, serving in Belgium in 1944. I wrote about Gino in the first book, and then I later learned that there was a part of his story that he had not told me. I did not know, uh, for all the times that I talked to him, that after he was uh, rescued, in effect, by his own men from the machine gun nest where he'd been fighting all night long, the heroic action that earned him the Congressional Medal of Honor, that he told his sergeant he wanted to go to a nearby church and pray not just for his lost comrades, but also for the German soldiers that had been killed. I thought that was uh, emblematic of that generation. It was a story about faith and humanity, uh, about the essential goodness of the people who were fighting in that war and how much they loathed the idea of war, but they were determined to defend the values of this country. My father's name was Robert Morasco. He was a member of the 10th Mountain Division, uh, fought and died in Italy in World War II. He was killed in February 1945. And our story is one of our visit to Italy to try to, to find information and facts, uh, any, any small iota of information regarding his death, the location, how he died, uh, because we knew very little as a family. Our, our mission came to an end when we met a gentleman, an Italian gentleman named Valerio Petrucci, who was well into his 60s when we met him. And he told us the story, uh, how he found my father's body. And he told us how he came across two American bodies who had just surfaced from the melting snows. And he described their conditions. And we knew that he had found my father's body. Valerio looked at me and he said to me in Italian, you know, I have uh, waited all my life for this moment. Uh, and I said, what moment? He said, the moment where I could meet someone, a family, a son, a wife, from one of these men. He said, now I've met you, and my story's complete. Each year, we have the same experience. The people of the village gather. They walk with us to the mountaintop. They have a mass said with us, presided over always by the local priest. And we always have this very emotional moment, this moment of bonding. The 10th Mountain Division was their liberators. Uh, and they see my father as the, the symbol of the 10th Mountain Division. He's the one that they know. Through them, I became to know him uh, much better than I ever could before. I do remember uh, the first visit, the second visit, looking at all these people honoring my father. And I remember thinking, uh, well, Dad, what do you think? Yeah. Did I do OK?
January 21st, 1943. Today is my brother Peter's birthday, in which he becomes 22 years old. He is in the U.S. Army. He left Italy in 1937, six years ago. He has not seen my mother since. I came to this country two years later. We both were from Italy. We stay there up to 16 years old, which my mother suffered so much to raise us up. And now that we can make her happy, she's still in that poor country of Italy. I wish with all my heart to see my mother, my poor mother. I wrote this poem in my grandmother's voice. My grandmother was Maria Concetta Adamo Fama. And she, all during the Second World War, was in Sicily. Her husband was in New Jersey. He had become an American citizen. He got his sons out, my father and my Uncle Pete. But she and my aunt remained in Sicily all through the Second World War. And they came in 1946. Pasta piselli, piselli e pasta. A simple lunch, poor people's feast. During the Second World War, your Aunt Dominic and I were alone in Sicily. The Germans in town, the Americans advancing. Your grandfather in New Jersey, an enemy land, no letters allowed. He'd set for his sons just before the war. I knew my sons were fighting for the Americans. Your aunt and I were alone and often hungry. Put the garlic and olive oil and some onions in the pan. When they're golden, throw in the peas, fresh or frozen, whatever you have. Add some water, let them cook. Throw in the basil, salt, pepper if you like, a little parsley. The miseria got so bad, winters were the worst. All we had to eat were onions, some dried fruit, a little wine. Forget about pasta. In the end, for many, the war's ethnic issues gave way to a profound sense of duty. Ultimately, they didn't perceive American patriotism and love of homeland as conflicting sentiments. Then we went to get sworn in. There were three, I'll never forget, three colonels at the table. They said, uh, you were born in Italy. What do you remember about Italy? Well, I was a little boy when I came here. You have relatives in Italy? Yes, I have cousins, a lot of cousins, uncles. He said, now, if you have to go when we invade Italy, they were invading Italy already. If you get over there and you see your cousin, would you shoot him down? I said, no. Well, what if your cousin would shoot you down? I don't think he would. How, 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 how could you be so sure? Because we're relatives. How, what better answer can I give? We're relatives, we're family. We're of the same blood. Vincent Jacobozzi, Staff Sergeant, 13 Air Force Pacific. Mike Magazzini, Air Force Sergeant. Louis J. Batita, 7th Army Air Force, Pacific Theater, radar operator. Frank Delmonico, Army. PFC. Tony Fragassi, Air Force, Staff Sergeant. Tom Spartano, U.S. Navy, Mortar Machinist Mate, Third Class. Francis Gino Minacci, Staff Sergeant, United States Air Force. Dominic Esposito, Army, Chief Warrant Officer. Raise your hand. Arms. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Put up arm. But there is this great irony that there they were, in some instances, uh, on opposite sides of battle lines from their cousins and other relatives. Um, the great, great thing about World War II, it was a true melting pot of the melting pot nation. And it was a time when we all came together in all of our parts, and as a result, we were greater than the sum of our parts. Uh, I worry that that lesson has been lost, uh, that people now divide themselves up, kind of uh, special interest by special interest, ethnic group by ethnic group, religion by religion. Uh, in Gino Murley's generation, they knew what the common objective was, and they set out to achieve it. Ironically, on the home front, as thousands volunteered time, labor, blood, and money, a different war was waging. An insidious thread of paranoia began to weave its way into this already curious tapestry. Cosa ho fatto? Perché io non siamo nemmeno. 
want to go in and search the house or residence of every alien right now. We can't fool around. When the United States finally entered the war, a number of President Roosevelt's closest advisors vigorously urged him to respond swiftly to the presence of non-naturalized Japanese, Germans, and Italians. Lieutenant General John DeWitt believed passionately that communities of aliens in the United States harbored fifth columnists who were waiting to strike on orders from Rome or Berlin. Uh, there was no truth to it whatsoever. Uh, there was no organized fifth column planning and plotting various acts of sabotage and so forth to, uh, to undermine the country. President Roosevelt regarded himself as a man who defended the notion of an American melting pot. My friends, I still believe in ideals. I am not for a return to that definition of liberty under which for many years a free people were being gradually regimented into the service of the privileged few. I prefer, and I am sure you prefer, that broader definition of liberty under which we are moving forward to greater freedom, to greater security for the average man than he has ever known before in the history of America. Still, on December 8, 1941, upon the counsel of DeWitt and Attorney General Francis Biddle, Roosevelt signed Proclamation 2527, essentially designating 600,000 non-naturalized Italians as enemy aliens. It was enforceable based on a 150-year-old law, the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. But there was a great deal of public pressure for them to act. And the politicians were very much afraid of, of where public opinion might lead, and they wanted to be out in front, and so they acted. And they acted instinctively rather than reasonably. The new law gave extensive authority to the Attorney General's office. At his discretion, raids could be conducted, homes broken into, and personal items confiscated radios, flashlights, cameras, anything deemed potentially dangerous in the hands of enemy aliens. All at once, the kitchen door got kicked in, and simultaneously, the front door got kicked in. And right before our eyes, was anywhere between five and eight men dressed in suits, dark suits, wearing, at that time, I thought there were maybe a Panama hat or a straw hat, and some of them brandishing revolvers. Some of them putting credentials up in our face and holler FBI. And uh, my mother was kind of festy. She went after one of them with a wooden spoon that she was using, stirring the pot. Well, they grabbed that out of her hand. And my dad was in the living room reading a newspaper, Sunday Inquirer. And he'd come running in, little guy, not violent, but protecting his wife and his family. And two of them got a hold of him. Didn't really rough him up, but pushed him against the wall and held him there. And he's hollering, like, what's going on? What, what, why are you here? And one of them said, we're here for the radio. I'm like, that's what he mean, radio? What radio? What did we do wrong? We had a radio that used to get shortwave from the fishermen in Monterey, and we used to enjoy listening to them cussing and whatever. And uh, that, that was taken. And um, the cameras... And things that, you know, what could we do with these things? Of course, General DeWitt, uh, he particularly did not like the Italians to begin with, and so he really, I believe, made it a lot tougher on them than they needed to. My uncle, who was my father's oldest brother, it turns out, never had citizenship, and his family, uh, during the war, his house was raided by the, by the authorities, and they came and took out the shortwave radio. I never knew a thing about this. Even more astonishing is that his wife 
was American born with, with forebears all the way back to the American Revolution, lost their citizenship as a result of marrying my uncle who was not a citizen, and she became an enemy alien too. Enemy aliens were subjected to curfews and travel restrictions. They were registered, fingerprinted, and issued ID cards. Those identified as dangerous by the FBI were arrested and interned in makeshift prisons and camps around the country. On December 17, 1941, an FBI agent accompanied by two San Francisco policemen arrested Carmelo Ilacra at his home. Carmelo had come to the United States in 1924 and, as an employee of the Italian consulate, retained his Italian citizenship and fascist party membership. A search of his home revealed nothing incriminating, but he was detained by the Immigration and Naturalization Service for questioning. In my mother's case, she was an enemy alien because she had not acquired citizenship um, at that point. Uh, that meant she had to go register, be fingerprinted, and was required to report uh, once a year uh, on that basis. That was a, a, a personal hurt to me, my brother, my sister, because we were all born in this country. We were American citizens and supposedly had rights as American citizens, but uh, because of that label placed on my mother, that impinged on us. And it raised uh, questions on our minds. Were we not really Americans? Were we not loyal? And I understand why Japanese didn't, Japanese Americans didn't speak out, because their parents are so accustomed to being treated as nothing at back home. And their cultural tradition at that structural, social structural level, they were accustomed to believing that anything government does, you can't fight. Crying baby and the government, you cannot fight. That's an expression. Whereas the Italian immigrants in this country, there is no such cultural background. So I just don't see why they did not speak out, challenge louder, right after the war. This dark chapter in American history is largely unknown. The details have been pressed between the scrapbook pages of a proud generation reluctant to be called victims. I had never heard of any of this, never heard of any of these events, never heard of anything that happened to Italian Americans during the war. I had cousins who, were, who fought in the war, but I had never heard anything like this. Italian Americans went through some uh, amazing restrictions in the West. They kept very quiet about it because they were very proud people, and they felt that they were made to feel that they had done something wrong, and, uh, and that wasn't it at all but they wanted to keep it quiet and they were embarrassed. After nearly a week in custody, Carmele Elacqua's wife, Bruna, and six-year-old daughter, Costanza, were allowed to visit him briefly and bring him some clothes. The next contact was December 29th, when Carmelo wired them that he had been transported to an internment facility in Missoula, Montana. Opera star Ezio Pinza was taken into custody by the FBI on March 12, 1942. Characteristic of these cases, the Department of Justice did not disclose the charges. He was held briefly in Manhattan and then transported by boat to an internment facility on Ellis Island. Ironically, scores of aliens were being returned to their port of entry, once an icon of sanctuary, now a temporary prison. The press and the authorities downplayed the arrest, but Pinzo, who was actually imprisoned for three months before a second hearing, finally gained his release. January 10th, 1942, Missoula, Montana. I'm beginning to be a little restless, as no mail from you yet. Also, immigration in San Francisco hasn't sent my belongings yet. I can only write two times a week, and not more than 29 lines. Lovingly, Carmelo. Getting on the bus to my new school was a little bit uh, embarrassing and uh, frustrating. Because I was considered an enemy alien, even though I was born here, 
Uh, to these children, I was an enemy. And they would all scatter and spread out on their seats in the bus so that I wouldn't have any place to sit. For any group to be rejected is a very high cost to the society, psychologically to begin with. Being labeled like enemy aliens kills off their energies, take away motivations. It's very counterproductive for the United States, and that should have never happened. 65-year-old Martini Battistessa, an Italian alien, could not understand why he should give up his locksmith and saw filing business of 20 years, unable to complete his naturalization before being declared an enemy alien by his adopted country and expelled from his home. He went to a bar and offered a friend $50 to shoot him in the head. The friend laughed and Battistessa left. A short time later, he threw himself in front of the southbound passenger train as it passed through Richmond, California. February 26, 1942. De Bruna, we must be patient and meet adversaries with courage and strength because justice will be done eventually to those who are innocent because God is infinitely good. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed into law Executive Order 9066, authorizing the Secretary of War to designate military areas within our shores. As a result, on the West Coast, thousands of Italians were forcibly relocated across arbitrary lines of demarcation. And those areas were relatively narrow corridors. They involved bays, harbors, inlets, defense installations, dams, power plants, all the kinds of things that would be considered of strategic interest to the country. So up and down the west coast, from Canada to Mexico, enemy aliens were told they would have to leave those restricted areas. It really was not important to my mother to be a citizen because her job was to take care of the family. Dad was a citizen, the children were all citizens, and she didn't have time, really because she was a very caring mother and was always uh, taking care of the house, cooking and doing her, uh, well, she kept a beautiful home. But when this arrived, that because she was not a citizen, she had to move, she was determined. So when we came back, it was back to school she went to learn about the language and to get her citizenship paper, which we were so very happy about. And that if you lived on, on the, the, the east side of Highway 101, you were declared, even if you were an enemy alien, you were okay. But if you happened to live on the other side of the street, you were not okay. And, and Italians and Germans and Japanese could not move across that imaginary line. So our family had to move. I had to quit high school, which was about six blocks away. I told the guy, I says, what, uh, why do I have to move? I said, can I just go to school and finish school? It's only going to be a matter of four or five months. And, you know, just go to school, I'll stay there, and then when it's over with, I'll cross the line and go home again, you know? He said, nope, you have to go across the line. Relocation separated families interrupted education, and forced heads of households to find alternative employment. In many cases, even minor violations of the new law resulted in arrests and internment. Well, I used to go to the movie theater in spite of the curfew, and I'd sit next to the police chief a few times and never bothered me because they took it for granted that I was born in this country all the time. Nobody paid any attention. And one night I just came home from visiting my girlfriend and there was a knock on the door and a young man had identified himself and said he was an FBI agent and he showed his credentials and he said he wanted to talk to my dad. So I called my dad, he was in bed already, and uh, he came over and looked and he talked to him and he says, started questioning him and I says, wait a minute, you don't want him. I said, you want me. I was the one that was out. So he said, you was out after curfew. And he says, you broke the law. He says, well, get your coat. 
So I went in my closet and got my heavy leather jacket I had, and he grabbed it out of my hand and he searched it. Went through all the pockets, made sure there wasn't anything in it, and he says, okay, let's go. And he took me over to the county seat, Eureka, and locked me up in county jail, and I was there for about better part of a week. And then they took me in a car. A marshal asked me if we want, another man and I, that if we wanted to behave ourselves, we'd do it the easy way, otherwise they put cuffs on us. And we said, well, we'll behave. And we drove to San Francisco, up to Silver Avenue, which was the FBI headquarters, and they didn't know what to do with us. So they locked us in a broom closet, which is about, oh, probably six by six or six by eight. Sat on the floor till they got a paddy wagon, and then they drove us out to Sharp Park. And then we went in there, and uh, it was a holding camp. It was divided in half. Half on the left side we went in were Japanese. And on the other, every other race and nationality you could think of was in there. Giuseppe Michele, a 57-year-old fisherman, was told by the authorities to leave his home in Vallejo. Confused and distraught, he cut his throat with a butcher's knife. 65-year-old Stefana Terranova refused the Justice Department order to relocate. Before leaping to his death from the roof of a building, he scribbled a note. I believe myself to be a good but find myself deceived. I don't know why. It is my fault for blaming others. My brain is no good. June 14th, 1942. Dear Carmelo, I received your letter of June 8th. You seem to be kind of sad, but dear daddy, you have to be patient and have faith that this cruel war will finish soon. I am sorry that from now on you will write only on special forms. I would like very much to visit you, but don't like to take Costanza. As I hear, the voyage is kind of strenuous. What do you think? Shall I come or wait for you to come back? Lovingly, Bruna. It was a very sad day. A lot of people were crying. It was like somebody had died. I didn't know where we were going, and I didn't know how long I was going to be gone. But I gave away all of my collection of pins to my schoolmates who I'd been in school with since kindergarten. And it was, it was a sad day for me. I didn't think I was coming back. The ironic thing about this uh, being sent away is that my father was building Liberty ships at the Kaiser shipyards in Richmond. My two brothers were working at Columbia Steel in Pittsburgh. My brother Sal's wife, who came here when she was just nine years old, has a one-year-old baby, and she hadn't had her papers, and she had to go away also. She was in Walnut Creek. And, and here my mother, who couldn't even speak English, you know, they sent her away. But fortunately, um, moving to Salinas, we found a house near an Italian family. My dad went back and forth to fish. And during that period of time, also, the boats were confiscated. The, the Navy needed to have boats to patrol the Pacific. The Diana was chosen. That left my father without a boat. So he had to look up and down the coast to see if there was a boat he could rent. Fortunately, there was one in San Pedro, so he did rent one and was able to fish in the waters of Monterey because food was a necessity in order to feed the servicemen and, and the needs were there. For those involved, it was a question of semantics, but the government insisted that the boats were actually requisitioned and that the owners were compensated. However, the small monthly fees were never enough to cover lost business and alterations that were not reversed before the vessels were returned move in with relatives, move in with friends, rent new properties, what would happen to their property that they already own, that's, you know, there wasn't a great deal of consideration given to that, uh, and there were various results of, uh, of that kind of thing. So it was very inconsistent and, and very haphazard and therefore looked upon, I think, by the people at the time as, as, as pretty silly altogether, although some of the stories were pretty tragic. <laughs> If not for the gravity of these uncertain times, the acrobatics associated with relocation might have appeared ludicrous, even laughable. 
and I couldn't go across to the dentist. So I said, what am I going to do? So I went to the police station, which was right next door to us. I said, well, he said, I can escort you over. I said, okay, that's fine, you know. So he had to walk with me across one block. So he walked me across and left me there. And the dentist re repaired my tooth. And then this Dr. Fountain, he had to call the police station. And they come over, picked me up, and brought me back across the line. It's a fascinating story in Eureka. One of the people that I interviewed for my book, actually a man and, and his two sons, he owned a business on the wrong side of, of this imaginary line in, in downtown Eureka, which he could not attend to every day. And so he would go down to, uh, to the business and stand across the street, and his son, who was at that time a teenager and able to handle things in the store, and he would bark orders across the street to his son about what he should do that day. And this, this man's pals would all gather around him while he was standing on the corner barking these orders across the street. June 19, 1942. Dear Bruno, this is my first letter from Camp Forest, Tennessee, where I arrived three hours ago after a trip of about 30 hours. On the train, we ate in the diner. And for the first time since they took me away from home, I ate at a table set with tablecloth and napkins. And myself and the others felt again that we are human beings. To add insult to injury, non-citizen Italians, sons of enemy aliens who never took the time to complete citizenship, victims of travel restrictions, curfews and registrations, young men forced east of imaginary military zones suddenly found themselves eligible for the draft. And I looked at my brother and I said, well, what are we going to do? I told him, I'm not going to go. Why should we go and fight for them when they did all this to us, which was unnecessary? So we didn't go. And sure enough, three days later, they sent up some lieutenant and come knocking at the door and he says, how come you didn't report? I said, why shouldn't we? And he told us why. He said, they want you in the army or the military. And he said, we don't have to. You can't uh, enlist an alien. That's against all your principles, all your rules and regulations. And he said, well, we're going to give you two alternatives. Either go to prison camp or go into service. I said, that's a big choice. Isn't it? <laughs> but uh, so we talked about it and the family said, well, you know, our ruined Italian name. I said, well, it's not going to ruin nothing. You know, I said, well, yeah, all the Italians say, oh, you refuse to go into service. Said, well, okay. So we, and to honor the name, we went into the service. We got accepted into the draft, and, and then we go up to the desk, and there was an Army, a Navy, and a Marine officers at the desk. And they put the paper on the Marine Corps' desk, and uh, they said, you're next. And he looked at it, and he says, I don't want no damn en enemy alien. So I put it over on the Navy, and he said, we don't want one either. And the Army took the paper and says, we're not particular. We'll take anybody. So I went into the Army. We went in front of the judge, and uh, he says, you guys are going to become citizens of the United States, you know? And I said, I'm going to speak, and then you just raise your hand and say, I do. And, uh, and he gave his speech and raised his hand and said, I do. He said, now you're American citizens, you know? One of the many unfortunate and even tragic ironies is the story of relocation, arrest, and imprisonment of families while their sons were fighting and dying for the American war effort overseas. My brother and I were next to each other in bed at the steel hospital. And there were civilian workers in there, and they came over and they were doing something to us. And uh, they kind of looked at the name and they asked, me, asked us if we were Italian. 
I said, yeah. I told him we were even born over here in, in Tassiano. And he said, really? Yeah. I said, well, who's your, you know, your relatives around there? So I gave him all the names and where they lived. And they said, oh, we know them. So I said, really? He said, will you contact them? He said, sure. We'll tell them that we're here. And that's all I remember. But I mean, the next day they, they came. How they got in the gate through the guards, I don't know. But they were there, and they come every day for, I don't know, about 10 days we were there. Nick Buccellato, a Navy man, came home on leave to Pittsburgh, California. The house was empty. His mother had been relocated. Steve Gio, during his leave, found many houses in Santa Cruz, including his own, boarded up. One woman, Rosina Trovato of Monterey, received evacuation orders the day after learning that both her son and nephew were lost on the Arizona in Pearl Harbor. It was an acceptance of life. This is what it brought us. This is what we must do. I didn't hear screaming or hollering or tears or, I think there was an inner sadness that was there. It was kind of a diminishing feeling that we didn't want to speak up. We were proud to be Italians, but this situation that we were in made us feel that maybe we should not boast about it. And it took us a long time before we felt again to stand tall and say, yes, we're Italians. July 5th, 1942. Dear Carmelo, the Red Cross here does not know a thing about helping the families of the interred. Patience. Let's hope that you will be back soon. Then you will work for us, and we won't need nobody's help. By July of 1942, the United States realized that there was never a threat of enemy invasion from the Pacific. Those Italians who had relocated were allowed to return to their homes. Any celebratory spirit, however, was overshadowed by loss of jobs, lost homes, and embarrassment. Curiously, the announcement was simply posted without fanfare in the local post offices. Those who could not read English remained in exile until the word finally filtered down. In a move that was unabashedly political, on Columbus Day, October 12, 1942, President Roosevelt announced that the Italians would no longer be classified as enemy aliens. Now, there were about 600,000 Italian aliens in the United States, and there were many reasons why the Roosevelt administration made this decision. One reason simply had to do with politics. Uh, this would be a politically useful thing for the administration in winning support from Italian American voters in the election of 19, in the congressional elections in 1942. While this was encouraging news to the interned and their families, it did not necessarily spell the end of incarceration. Reluctant authorities dragged their feet through mounds of bureaucratic red tape. March 1, 1943. Honorable Sirs, I respectfully apply hereby for a rehearing before the proper Board of Appeals of the case of my husband, Mr. Carmelo Ilacqua, who is at present interred at Cap McAllister, Oklahoma, as an enemy alien. On September 4, 1943, 21 months after his arrest, Carmelo Ilacqua was finally released. Three months earlier, in his final rehearing, the board commended his loyalty to the U.S. and concluded that Ilacqua had always been opposed to the Axis. By the end of 1943, Nearly 50,000 Italian POWs were imprisoned in 27 camps around the country. For the first time in its history, America held foreign enemies on its soil. And this provided an intriguing backdrop to the ever-changing Italian-American landscape. 
this created a real conflict for people who had family members who were interred in some of the labor camps around the country, uh, torn between choosing between country and family. Do you go visit and support a family member who you may not have seen since you've immigrated, or do you remain home and remain American in a sense and recognize that these are our enemies? You know, for some people, it's, it's a tremendous conflict. It's family. You're, you're related to these individuals, and you want to support them in their time of being separated from their homeland. Going to visit the enemy at this period of time would raise suspicion in your neighbor's minds. We were in a POW camp in North Africa. I do not recall exactly where, but it was not in Shanxi, the last POW camp in which a guard, an American soldier, was guarding his father that was a P, an Italian POW with us. And uh, when the American authority found out uh, the case, they naturally took the soldier out of his duty and uh, gave a different duty. But this is, uh, in my opinion, a tangible, tangible proof that we had absolutely no hard feeling toward the American because it was not something that the American wanted, it's not something that the Italian wanted. Just the circumstances above us made it such that the conflict took place. The American boy that uh, captured me, uh, when he asked me if I was, he looked at me, since I have blue eyes, he probably thought I was German, and he says in, in English, uh, German? In Italian, the word Germany is Germania, so I understood that much. No, I says, Italiano. And the guy says, hey, paisan. I says, I knew the war was over for me, you know. When we arrived that morning in Weingarten, Missouri, we walked to the POW camp. The officers were assigned in a little barrack, four officers for each little, shall I say, compartment. There were two beds in one room, two beds in another room, and a sort of uh, entrance room in which it was a stove. For the first time I saw a bed, sheets, pillowcase. I couldn't believe my eyes. I am confident I had a tear in my eyes. Shortly after they told us it's time to go for breakfast. Before I, we went to breakfast, I wanted to go to the bathroom. This was something for you, American people, you had no idea because you are born and raised in the abundance of everything. We were not. That is the truth. I went to the bathroom and I saw the sinks. I saw the spigot with hot water, cold water. When I went to war in Africa uh, at a place called El Alamein, you know, I, I was kind of worried because there were people trying to kill me. They were shooting at me, you know. You know, war is something I didn't know. I just went like everybody else. And, uh, and I thought a couple of mad, mad, mad people like Mussolini and Hitler were trying to have us young, uh, inexperienced people uh, trying to conquer the world for them, you know. Well... They didn't. I was lucky enough to be captured eventually by the Americans. And uh, I always said that if I knew they were that nice, I would have given up a hell of a lot sooner. At Camp Sutton, North Carolina, former Italian prisoners of war, now members of a United States Engineer Service Unit, undertake their new duties. Italian service units were made up of the Italian POWs who then were released to do other kinds of work, while German POWs still had to be very careful and could not do anything in favor of the war effort. Italian POWs were now able to do things that would promote the war effort short of combat. Although most Italian war prisoners were inclined to cooperate, some remained loyal fascists. 
were approximately 15,000 POWs that didn't join the Italian service units, and for various reasons. Some of them were afraid that their family would be hurt back home, that there'd be retribution against their family if word ever got out that they had joined these units. Some feared that when they returned to Italy, that they would be considered traitors. And then others simply were fascists and for political reasons would not join ISU units. The camp, of course, had all types of Italians in there, and many of them were ardent fascist sympathizers. So if they found out that a person, one of the, one of the prisoners had signed up to come help the Allies, they would resent that. And I, I heard many stories of the, the fascist sympathizers physically beating these fellows before they left, before they came with us. A guy from Naples who was a cook, he told me the last four nights he slept with a knife under his pillow because he was afraid of the sympathizers. They were making it very difficult for them once they found out that they had signed up to help the Allies. Quindi impressione di America, penoso. Stazione americana, paesano. No, io non paesano, io italiano, tu americano. Quindi non paesano, niente. Tu venire a bombardare bombe, uccidere gente nostra. Paesano, non parlare. Niente paesano. Peccato noi non avere il plan di venire a buttare bombe in casa tua, perché impareresti. When the conflict ended, all Italian prisoners of war were sent back to Italy. While some chose to remain there, others returned to the land of their captives to start new lives, even marry the American sweethearts they romanced while in prison. When uh, Italy surrendered, my father started getting mail from Italy and his, some of his relations and friends, they said, we have our sons are in America and they're prisoners of war and would you go and visit them? Of course, they didn't realize that some of them said my son is in California, that we were in Ohio, that wasn't too easy, you know. So my, what my dad did is found out who was in Ohio. And we found out that Camp Perry, there was prisoners there, so he made plans to go and visit them. So he did this, I can't recall whether it was the second year that he finally said, he had taken my three sisters that were younger than I, and he said, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to camp, and you're coming with me. And I went, oh, yeah, right, to myself. I'm not going anywhere. It's a bunch of, you know, foreigners. So anyhow, he just said, well, tomorrow. I said, I have to work. And he said, I don't care. He said, tomorrow you're coming with us. So like 4 o'clock in the morning or some got a ungodly hour, he woke us all up and said, get ready. Because at that time, it took you like three hours to get to Camp Perry. So... Um, I just got in the car, took my movie magazines, my hair up in rollers, and a babushka on my head. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm going to stay in the car. I'm not going to get out. So we got there, and my sisters start going, oh, look at the guys are all at the gate, and, you know, they're so cute, and they're so handsome. And I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. So I asked where the washroom was, went in, took my curlers out of my hair, and danced the rest of the day. <laughs> and that's where I met my husband. And of course, many Americans were irritated when they would see these uh, uh, POWs, which in the eyes of many Americans were still enemies. And they would be irritated when they'd see them using, uh, being bust and using precious gasoline that many people couldn't have access to, or, or smoking, and tobacco was being rationed during the war. So there was considerable hostility, and, and they the term coddling became very popular then. Newspaper editorials would talk about the coddling, would write about the coddling of prisoners. And the War Department tried to, um, well, did put out publications indicating how many man hours of labor they contributed to the war effort to try to alleviate this hostility. The war was, in many respects, not the good war that it was supposed to be. The war saw internment to Japanese Americans and a wholesale violation of their civil liberties. The war saw race riots and a good deal of racial conflict in the country, in Detroit and in other places. The war saw the government involve itself in propaganda. Control was said in the movies. Control was said in the press. Uh, the, the war, in many respects, was not the good war that it was made out to be. And that's something that we need to remember. In 
In November of 1999, a bill was introduced before the 106th Congress. The intent was to finally detail the injustices suffered by Italian Americans during World War II, ultimately encouraging a formal acknowledgement by the President. When it was first called to my attention that uh, Italian Americans were interned during World War II, uh, it was something that I really couldn't believe. And in fact, that has been the reaction of everyone who has found out about this bill, that people just uh, cannot believe that this actually happened. Uh, my administrative assistant, John Calvelli, and I thought that it might be a good congressional response to have legislation which would allow the American public to understand what happened, which would have the president acknowledge the fact that it did happen, and to uh, let the American people understand that this happened and ought never to happen again uh, to any group of Americans. Rick Lazio, former congressional representative of the state of New York, co-sponsored H.R. 2442. The bill that we are discussing today represents an attempt, I think a very balanced and very modest attempt to begin setting the record straight. The wartime violation of Italian American Civil Liberties Act calls upon the Department of Justice to conduct a comprehensive study of our government's policies toward Italian Americans during the war to find out exactly what took place and to whom. So that's really the story. It's a, it's a secret story. It's a story that's been suppressed, repressed, um, and, and the, the object of silence in the Italian community for so many years. We were told that the United States Department of Justice would not disclose to us what charges had been made against Ezio. Needless to say, that seemed to us a highly unusual and unfair policy for the American court. Ezio was totally innocent of any wrongdoing against the country. He was due to receive his final citizenship papers in four months, and we had not the slightest idea of what allegations had been made. To have this happen is really an affront to all Americans, not only Italian Americans. And so I think that if simply Italian American members of Congress sponsored this, it could easily be dismissed as saying, well, you know, they only care about it because this is just an Italian thing. This isn't just an Italian thing. This is an American thing. And it's a blight on the history of this country. And uh, we need to ensure that this could never happen again. And uh, that's why we're asking uh, for an acknowledgement and we're asking uh, for the government to open its files because there are still sealed files, as far as we know, uh, documenting th this uh, terrible uh, tragedy. And uh, we want to get to the total truth. That's really what is at stake here. We want the truth. And if there are documents that are still sealed, I want to know why. And I want those documents to see the light of day. After completing the 1942 baseball season, I enlisted in the United States Navy. It was an honor to serve my country, and I gladly put my baseball career on hold to do so. However, I had no idea that while I was away fighting for my country, the United States government declared Italian Americans enemy aliens. It saddens me to think that my mother and father were considered enemy aliens by the country they adored so much. Well, I think it's important from a personal perspective. It's um, my way of uh, helping my grandfather deal with a terrible period in his life and helping the Italian-American community grapple with so many issues that we haven't dealt with. Um, we often say, why have we lost our heritage? Why have we lost our culture? Why don't so many Italian-Americans speak the language? And I think it all goes back to that period from 1941 to 1945. And in a small way, I'm helping to answer that question for my grandfather and helping it answer that question for the Italian-American community. Under the provisions of the Freedom of Information and Privacy Acts, I have received dozens of documents from the FBI. A brief summary of these documents will illustrate the unconscionable manner in which my father's most basic civil liberties were abused and the core principles of the Constitution were abrogated. Even today, almost 60 years after the fact, the names of my father's accusers to the FBI, and indeed their very allegations have been blacked out or sanitized in these documents. On February 19, 1976, Gerald Ford's speech 
an American promise officially rescinded Executive Order 9066 after 34 years. On November 7th, 2000, President Clinton, quietly, without fanfare, signed the wartime violation of Italian-American Civil Liberties Act. However, the ink of a president's pen, in and of itself, does not heal. For Italian-Americans, it has taken determination, uncommon passion, and calloused hands that have reached down from generation to generation. Well, we've had the government's accounting and disclosure in the November 2000 wartime violation of Italian-American Civil Liberties Act. But I'm afraid that a lot of people are going to be disappointed in the report itself, which falls short, really, of a full accounting of, of the individuals who were affected by these government policies. America, it seems, has always possessed the ability to rethink its prejudices and shift itself into a position of tolerance. And the remarkable fact is, in spite of, or perhaps more accurately, as a result of, the struggles and sacrifices of a confused and frightened Italian immigrant population, these survivors and their descendants have returned to us volumes of fortitude, character, and heritage, which ultimately has enriched us as a nation. Nevertheless, a nation's integrity is defined only to the degree that it is willing to question its past. Yeah. 